questions about mantralaya and explicatory answers for those the questions figuring in this chapter are not those which i am raising but are the ones brought to me by a good number many have contacted me about the mantralaya flood and the news published about the devastation wanting to know the real happenings and what follows here is only a gist of it to know the answers for such queries i had approached several sources for nearly a year to gather relevant information for presentation in my writing some told me what they knew others even if knowing denied knowledge of those yet others got wild with me as if i need not have to bother about those while a small number surmised that i was seeking some information confidentially that could be harmful to the interests of others my presentation here is based purely on the information furnished to me by many but on some points i have expressed my personal opinion too in the passing the question the questions and the explanatory answers relevant to those follow seriatim question 1 it is said that in 1892 ad a flood had almost submerged the mantralaya moola brindavana after that in 2009 ad a deluge had engulfed mantralaya since the mart is maintaining a record of all happenings is there no such cataloging of that event of the last decade of the 19th century answer the information obtained on inquiry with the mat authorities and those belonging to the lineage of shri raghavendra swami reveals that in 1992 a moderate flood had caused water to enter up to the inner sanctum of the mat but that nothing is on record with shri mat of any flood occurrence there well over a century before that date when shri raghavendra had entered the brindavana there had been a comparatively less violent flood at that time it's not known whether there were any barrages then at various places across the tungabhadra river however during shri sumatindra's pontificate 1692 through 1725 there must have been a flood as is evident from the history of Helavanakatte Giriyamma in the light of the absence of records pertaining to the earlier periods concerning floods in the Tungabhadra we are placing on record here for the knowledge of posterity the facts about the 2009 flood to inform future generations even centuries later question 2 mantralaya kshetra belong to shri prahlada in the krita yuga and yet his later avatar shri raghavendra had obtained manchala as a gift from siddhi masood khan shri raghavendra even after getting the benefaction had prayed to manchaliyamma the goddess of that place seeking her approval and blessings for the installation of his brindavana there thus setting up the ethical convention that devotees should first worship manchaliyamma before offering their obeisance to him and this place has been in this practice has been in vogue since then in mantralaya why so why was manchaliyamma suddenly removed from her place and kept inside did the temple management make alternate arrangements then for puja could it be that the goddess had turned wrathful because of shifting her from the original place is it because of such fury that of that goddess the deluge has occurred or is it to quell the vehemence of her rage that water has entered inside answer it is true that manjaliyamma was shifted from her original place for repairs purification of the temple it is customary to, to do the uh, kalaka uh, kalakakshana of the idol kalakarshana of the idol at a different place after such removal from its place in 2010 ad nearly 1 and 1/2 years later and before the aradhana of shri raghavendra 
it was reinstalled at its original place and Kumbhavisheka too was performed at that time. Readers' attention is drawn to the picture of the Manchaliyamma temple printed here, from which it could be discerned that the shrine is presenting a more majestic version now than, the, than before. The facade of the shrine is taller now than the sanctum of Sri Raghavendra Brindavana. It's not unlikely that at a future date, the front side of the Sri Mat may also undergo changes and present a larger image. There are some people who are not satisfied with this explanation, a majority of the dissatisfied lot thinking that the idol was removed for some reason but has later been installed in its original place after the flood. Question 3. Though Sri Raghavendra had entered the Brindavana alive in 1671 AD, it is believed that even today he goes to the river early in the morning for his ablution and completes his religious rituals thereafter. In your writing too, you have penned that in the wee hours he has given darshan to many devotees. Generally, for the Brindavana darshan, devotees are allowed entry inside after 6 a.m. only. The priests are however present there by 4.30 or 5 a.m. But after the Aradhana of 2009, some exorbitant seva charges of rupees 50,000, rupees 1 lakh have been prescribed and devotees who pay those are permitted entry inside the sanctum even in the early hours of the morning. The sevas are started very early in the morning. Besides, the Guru Sarva Bauma children who have come there for Vedic learning are made to chant Ved mantras at that hour even as they are half asleep. Are not these changes hindering the early morning rituals of Sri Raghavendra? Is it not after the introduction of this new scheme of operations that Mantralaya has been affected by such devastating flood? Answer. It is true that Sri Raghavendra goes to the Tungabhadra early in the morning. In the Dhanurmasa and on the Dwadashi day, Puja, Abhisheka are in fact performed in the early hours. It cannot, however, be construed that these sevas hamper Sri Guru Raja performing his rituals in the early hours of the day. There cannot also be any other form of impediment to Sri Guru Raja's meditation and prayer at that time. The students doing Parayana in the morning hours is only for their good. The charges for certain serva sevas being excessive is not very relevant as it is only those who can afford to pay those amounts who contribute such karnikes. These were the explanations I could gather in reply to the aforementioned queries. Yes, even if Sri Raghavendra comes out of the Brindavana when devotees are present there, it's only those who are blessed to have his darshan who can see him in their presence. The Thomas Munro episode covered in part 1 and the incident pertaining to Sri Bhuvanendra, recounted in part 2, revealed this indubitably. Question 4. It is true that on account of the flood entering Mantralaya, the residents have suffered heavy loss of things and property. But the nebulous estimate of the Sri Mat having sustained loss to the tune of several crores of rupees appears to be off the mark. It's a fact that the Srimat always keeps adequate stock of rice, food grains and other items required for the daily Anadana. In the first week of October, for the Kalakashana of Sri Sushimendra Tirtha, a larger holding of such stock to feed about 2 lakh devotees could have been stored in the Srimat. And it is not improbable that all those could have been swept away in the flood or spoiled in the dampness caused by the water that had engulfed the mud premises. The bedrolls, pillows provided in the lodges of the Srimad could also have been rendered unusable 
by the air getting soaked in water. The temporary shops rented out to the traders by the streamer could have been washed away in the deluge and the things kept in those lost. But the items stored in such shops would have been those belonging to the traders only. The flood did not enter Mantralaya all of a sudden but only gradually and its erratic co uh, course caused havoc only after 1 a.m. In the few hours before the devastation, when the water level was only gradually ri rising, many valuable things, stored items, documents, etc. could have been moved to safer places. While so, how is it that the loss suffered by the Srimat is said to be of gargantuan proportions? Answer. It is uh, well known that enormous quantity of food stocks were swept away in the deluge. Annadana being a daily affair, thousands of devotees being fed every day, the Godon will would always be storing huge quantity of food grains, the monetary value of which should run to several lakhs of rupees. At the time of the deluge, the stocks of items held in the storehouse was much more than the normal holding. But apart, even at other places connected with the streamer, there was huge destruction as gathered from various sources. But none could estimate with precision the extent of loss. Or maybe even if equipped with such information, they did not want to divulge it. What appeared in the press was perhaps based on surmise, according to them. It's a fact that there were ravages. And if the value of the loss was not considerable, it's indeed heartening. But if it was large, Sri Guru Raja will grace its recompense, was the hope expressed by many. Question 5. After the flood had subsided, even as devotees from across the continents were contributing liberally for rehabilitation, the manner in which an appeal was made through a branch of the Srimat in Tamil Nadu for donations to develop a new mantralaya was rather painful. The banners put up for that purpose had depicted the picture of cows lying dead in the Goshala. That was awful to behold. Incidentally, this raised the question why there was negligence in letting them loose, even as the flood level was rising gradually. If they had been untied from their fetters, many of those could have saved themselves from the icy hands of death. Are there not sufficient number of men to look after the needs of those animals in the Goshala? Will it be wrong to conclude that it was not merely the onrush of water that was the cause for their death, but that they are not being let off when the water was rising? contributed also in no small measure to such calamity. Answer. The feedback about these was that the public indignation regarding the uncouth banner and devotee's strong feelings about the way funds were sought to be collected had indeed gone to the notice of the Mantralayamat, but that they had said that they had not given any such instructions and the banner had unilaterally been displayed by the manager of the branch concerned. As the water level was rising, the cattle violently freed themselves from their pegs and ran for their life. And when some persons had gone to let them free, they had to face the risk of their being knocked down and trampled over. Yet, they had tried their level best and saved many heads of cattle. Still, some cows lost their life under unavoidable circumstances. It's only those small number which had died that have been pro pro portrayed in the banners. In Chennai particularly, this seems to have been given wide publicity. It's unfortunate that someone had done this of his own violation. Such actions surely deserve condemnation and there should be no repetition of those in future. It's reiterated that what is presented here is only the replies we got to questions raised by the readers. If more information is furnished by readers 
or clarifications are sought by them, they will find publication in the next volume or the one after that. The question fig figuring next is the one proposed by devotees who have been impelled to raise it because of the news that appeared in the press and the ill-conceived plan of action implemented for collecting funds. Question 6. It's of course conceded that there was destruction of things and properties to a considerable extent, but the amounts in deposit with banks could in no way have been lost due to this catastrophe. The amounts paid for the sevas, the donations proffered and other receipts of money should all have been lying with banks only in the accounts of the Sriman. After meeting all the administrative expenses and the outflow of funds connected with the sevas, pujas, etc., the mat should still have had large deposits with banks. Besides, the branches of the mat at various places should also be having such funds always. While so, why has such a gloomy picture been presented? As if the Srimad has lost everything. Answer. To answer this question, it was not necessary for me to seek information from any source. It was only because of the indiscreet action of someone that such a public perception had been caused to be created. And by now, it should be clear that the Srimad was in no way connected with that. The question was also raised how in spite of liberal donations from the Andhra and Karnataka governments, the T uh, TTD and the thousands of devotees spread all over the world, the Mantralaya Aradhana pamphlet of 2010 had mentioned the figure of such assistance at rupees 6 crores only. It was however clarified later that it was the devotees contribution that uh, uh, aggregated to that sum as the Karnataka government, Infosys and other benefactors had spent amounts themselves for the various rehabilitation scheme. So, keeping aside the financial matter, it's necessary now that we pay attention to the human aspects of the devastation. Question 7. It is said that the flood had only affected routine life in Mantralaya and there had been no loss of human life. But newspapers have published pictures of human corpses lying scattered. Why should truth be concealed in this manner? My answer to this is that the death of cows in the Goshala is a fact. The death of other quadrupeds, living creatures, is also undeniable. Also, my relatives had themselves seen a couple of human bodies entangled in trees and lying near the roadside when they were travelling to Adoni, two days after the deluge. In a Tamil daily too, a picture of a human corpse lodged on a gate in Mantralaya had been published. But the dead were not the inhabitants of Mantralaya or any of the visitors to that place. They were the bodies of those washed away by the flood from the villages upstream which got entrapped in trees and other obstacles in Mantralaya and outside along the course of the river. In spite of devastation of such magnitude, loss of life was minimal and in Mantralaya there was no loss of human life. Manjaliyamma bore the brunt of the swirling waters but the adornments in her neck were intact when examined after the recession of the water. Though the Mula Brindavana had submerged fully, the idols kept on the Brindavana, particularly the Lakshmi Narasimha Vigraha, were in their places, not exhibiting even the slightest disturbance from their purchase. It was only a coating of slush that had covered the Brindavana and the Prakara, sequel to the flood. There have been no other damage. Question 8. Why has not Sri Raghavendra prevented this deluge? Could somebody, uh, could something morally unjustifiable have taken place in Mantralaya? Or has something unacceptable happened in the Srima? Is it because of some such occurrence that Sri Raghavendra has not prevented the deluge? Answer. 
I did not place these questions before anybody to get the answers. For none can say with certainty the answers for those. And even if something wrong had happened, no one would come forward to admit it. And unless proved, nothing can be accepted as credible. Therefore, I leave this to the judgment of the readers. However, my views about why Sri Raghavendra had not prevented the flood and what steps are to be taken to prevent such onrush of the river in future follow in the next chapter.